It makes you wonder if maybe the DET is emphasizing different skills or testing them in a way that doesn't translate as directly to academic performance in certain graduate programs. This is the TOEFL Speaking Prep Podcast for the AI era. Hey there. You've been wondering about how well English proficiency tests actually predict success for students at UHM, and you're not alone. This is a big question for a lot of people, especially with so many different tests out there. It really is, and it's not just about getting into the university, right? It's about how well those test scores reflect a student's ability to actually thrive in their courses once they arrive. Exactly, and that's what makes this new research from McGehee and Isbell so interesting. They dug into data specifically from UHM, a large public university, and focused on international students who started from fall 2022 onwards, right when things were getting back to normal after COVID. Which is a really important detail because it means we're looking at a more accurate picture of what the typical student experience is like now. Totally. So no more guessing games based on pre-pandemic trends. This is the real deal. Okay, so let's get to the heart of it. Did McGehee and Isbell find a connection between these test scores and how well students performed in their first year? Well, they focused on first-year GPA as one measure of success, and they found that overall there's a moderate correlation between English proficiency scores and GPA. But here's where it gets interesting. This correlation was only statistically significant for students who took the TOEFL exam. Wait, so out of all the tests, IELTS, DA, the whole bunch, TOEFL was the only one that really stood out when it came to predicting first year GPA. That's right. Now, it's crucial to remember that correlation doesn't equal causation. Just because there's a link between TOEFL scores and GPA doesn't mean a high TOEFL score guarantees a certain GPA. Right. There are always other factors at play, like how motivated a student is or how well they adapt to a new learning environment. Absolutely. And this is where looking at the nuances of the research becomes even more important. For instance, the findings differed when they looked at graduate students versus undergraduate students. OK, let's unpack that. What did they find when they separated the data that way? For graduate students, only the IELTS scores showed a statistically significant correlation with GPA. That's a pretty big contrast to the overall findings where TOEFL was the front runner. Wow, that's surprising. I mean, we often hear about TOEFL being the gold standard, especially for students coming to the U.S. So yeah. why do you think IELTS might be a stronger predictor of success specifically for grad students at UHM? That's the million dollar question. Um, it could be related to the specific skills each test emphasizes. Maybe the IELTS does a better job of assessing the kind of critical reading, analytical writing, and in-depth discussion skills that are essential for success at the graduate level. That makes a lot of sense, and it really highlights how important it is to consider the specific context, in this case, grad school at UHM, yeah. when we're trying to understand what these test scores really tell us. Precisely. And speaking of interesting findings specific to UHM, the data on the DET, that's the Duolingo English test for those who are new to this world, uh, revealed something pretty unexpected, especially for those grad students. Okay, I've got to hear this. What do they find about the DET? For graduate students at UHM, DET scores showed a negative correlation with first year GPA. Negative. So does that mean students who scored higher on the DET actually tended to have lower GPAs? That seems counterintuitive. It does, doesn't it? It's important to note that this negative correlation wasn't statistically significant, so we can't draw any definitive conclusions from it. But it definitely raises questions about how well the DET aligns with the demands of graduate level coursework at UHM. It makes you wonder if maybe the DET is emphasizing different skills or testing them in a way that doesn't translate as directly to academic performance in certain graduate programs. Right. And that's something for those programs, maybe even the university as a whole, to consider, are there other ways to assess those skills or are there ways to better support students who come in with strong BET scores but might need some extra help in other areas? Really interesting food for thought. So we've been talking a lot about GPA, but I know from personal experience that academic success is about more than just grades. What about other indicators of how well students are doing? Like, are they staying in their programs or facing academic challenges? That's a really important point, and the researchers looked into that as well. They considered things like whether students were placed on academic probation or if they ended up withdrawing from the university, what they called negative academic actions. So not just how well they're performing in their courses, but whether they're able to stay on track and complete their degrees. What did McGehee and Isbell find? This is where the research gets particularly interesting for students who might assume a high English proficiency automatically translates to a smooth academic journey. They found that students who were exempt from taking any English proficiency test, for example, 
native English speakers or students who had studied in English speaking countries for a significant period actually had higher rates of these negative academic outcomes. Wow, that is unexpected. I would have thought those students would be the least likely to struggle what could be contributing to those higher rates of academic challenges for students who were exempt from the tests. That's a critical question, and it suggests that UHM's criteria for exempting students from these tests might need further examination. It could be that the current criteria are too lenient, or perhaps there are other factors beyond just language proficiency that are contributing to those challenges. Like maybe those students are facing cultural adjustment issues or they're not as familiar with the academic expectations at a U.S. university? Exactly. Or it could be a combination of factors. The key takeaway here is that simply exempting students based on certain background criteria might not be enough to ensure their success. So for those students who did take the English proficiency exams, did their starting proficiency level, whether they were admitted unconditionally or conditionally, have any bearing on the correlation between their test scores and their academic performance? That's a great question, and the study did address that. For those unfamiliar, conditional admission basically means a student is admitted to the university but required to take additional English language courses, often because their English proficiency test scores weren't quite high enough for direct entry into their chosen academic program. It makes sense that those students would have a different starting point than those who are admitted unconditionally. So how did those different admission categories play out in the research? Among the students who entered UHM through conditional admission, meaning they needed to take those extra English courses, IELTS and TOEFL scores were significantly correlated with their GPA. So for those two tests, a higher score, even at that lower proficiency level, seemed to be a better predictor of how well students would perform academically. Okay, so even though those students were starting from a different point, the IELTS and TOEFL still had some predictive power. What about the DEET deed? Did they find a similar correlation for students who are conditionally admitted based on their DEET scores? That's where things diverge a bit. The study did not find a statistically significant correlation between DET scores and GPA for students who entered through conditional admission. So to recap, for students who were conditionally admitted, IELTS and TOEFL scores correlated with GPA, but DT scores did not. And if we think back to the graduate students where we saw that negative correlation with DT scores, it paints a bit of a complicated picture for how the DET is playing out in this context. It does, and it underscores the importance of not treating all English proficiency tests as interchangeable, especially when we're looking at different academic levels and starting proficiencies. It seems like there's a lot more to uncover here, and it's not just about the tests themselves, but also about how universities are using them and what kind of support they're providing to their international students, regardless of their initial proficiency level. Absolutely. It's about understanding the whole student and their unique journey. And on that note, let's take a moment to consider the broader implications of all this. If English proficiency tests aren't always the most reliable predictors of success, what does that mean for how universities evaluate international applicants? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? This research really challenges us to think beyond just those test scores. If even high scores or exemptions aren't guaranteeing success, what other factors should universities be considering? Right. It's like, what makes a student truly ready for the demands of university life, especially in a new cultural context? It seems like there's a lot more to it than just proving you can write a good essay or understand a lecture in English. Absolutely. And while this one study doesn't give us all the answers, it does offer some compelling clues. We might need to start thinking about cultural readiness alongside academic preparedness. Are students familiar with the expectations of a U.S. university system? Do they have the support systems in place to navigate those differences? It's like, how do we equip students to really thrive, not just survive? And I imagine that's especially crucial for those who might be dealing with the added challenges of cultural adjustment on top of everything else. Exactly. Universities might need to look at things like um, orientation programs, academic advising, even peer mentoring ways to provide more targeted support, especially during that critical first year. And this isn't just about making life easier for international students, right? It's about tapping into the incredible value and unique perspectives they bring to the university community. Precisely. When these students succeed, the whole university benefits. So as we wrap up this deep dive, we're left with some big questions. What does it really mean to be proficient in English in an academic setting? How can universities better identify those students who are set up for success? And how can they provide the support needed 
to help all students thrive. It's a complex issue with no easy answers, but this research is a great starting point for some important conversations. It certainly has been for us. And for you listening, we hope this deep dive has given you some new insights into the world of English proficiency tests and what they really tell us about academic success at UHM. It's always a pleasure to dig into these topics with you. Until next time, stay curious, my friends.